So this sets the kind of background against which Nixon's prohibition of psychedelics came into came into effect. And this was kind of, yeah, you have the kind of hedonism of the youth, right, that, that Leary is amping up. And that's tied in with the kind of, you know, you're saying about advocating people think for themselves and you have um, that kind of anti-war left part of that, the youth who are not going to Vietnam, and then you also have the civil rights movement. And in that context, you have this, this moral panic of, you know, in which Nixon claims he's looking out for public health with this war on drugs. But it seems in retrospect, that's really not what it was about, right? Yeah, um, he definitely put on the patina of the idea that we were trying to safeguard the public health and curb the drug abuse epidemic. But really what the new drug legislation was all about was that Nixon and his aides had conspired to not only target, but also investigate, harass, and incarcerate his enemies by uh, giving the executive branch essentially unbridled power. Uh, there was a really great article that came out in April of 2016 in Harper's Magazine. Uh, Dan Baum had uh, was uh, was lucky enough to interview uh, John Ehrlichman, who had served as the former legal counsel of the Nixon White House. So you know this wasn't some minor uh, White House aide. He was buddy buddy with Nixon, and uh, Dan Baum had noted that he, he had spoke with quote the bluntness of a man who after public disgrace and a stretch in federal prison had little left to protect. And uh, Ehrlichman had candid candidly acknowledged, uh, some of you might've heard this quote before, but he had said that quote, the Nixon campaign in 1968 and the Nixon White House after that had two enemies, the anti-war left and black people. Do you understand what I'm saying? We knew we couldn't make it illegal for uh, to be either against the war or black, but by getting the public to associate hippies with marijuana and the blacks with heroin and then criminalizing both heavily, we could disrupt those communities. We could arrest their leaders, raid their homes, break up their meetings and vilify them night after night on the evening news. Did we know we were lying about the drugs? Of course we did. He would go on to say that uh, we understood that the drugs were not the health problem. We were making them out to be but it was such a perfect issue that we couldn't resist. <sighs> the central theme of Nixon's drug legislation, the criminalization of addiction had openly refuted the Supreme Court's ruling in the case of Robinson v. California in 1962. It's a really interesting case. I haven't heard many people talk about it before, but it definitely deserves more attention with uh, with uh, with the modern perspective of the war on drugs. Uh, the case concerned one Lawrence Robinson, who was charged by the state of California with being addicted to the use of narcotics. They happened to have a law which specifically made it illegal to be an addict. Uh, he was essentially arrested on the street. Uh, the officers had had written in a report that Robinson had admitted to being an addict. Robinson later denied this, but moot point, it made its way up to the Supreme Court. Uh, it's also important to consider that uh, at the time when he was arrested, he was neither under the influence of narcotics, nor was he suffering withdrawal symptoms, nor did he possess heroin or any other controlled substance. Uh, now, even though the scourge of heroin abuse continues to lead millions to demonize opioid addicts, uh, six justices on the Supreme Court sh uh, struck down that unconstitutional California statute, which made it illegal to be an addict. Uh, they ruled in favor of Robinson and noted that laws which criminalize the, quote, disease of addiction, quote, would doubtless, uh, would doubtless universally be thought to be an infliction of cruel and unusual punishment. Uh, simply put, the court had dealt a strike blow to the rising legislative efforts which had uh, aimed to incarcerate addicts, especially if they were not, quote, guilty of any antisocial behavior. Uh, in a separate concurring opinion, I really enjoyed this, uh, Justice Douglas had elaborated on his belief that the incarceration of addicts was a form of cruel and unusual punishment. He really used strong language to express his opinion here. Uh, the imprisonment of addicts 
he opined, was a, quote, barbarous action, which our nation cannot, quote, tolerate in our present age of enlightenment, end quote. The purpose of the California statutes, in his words, quote, is not to cure, but to penalize, end quote, a choice which he had remarked had ignored the American Medical Association's position that applying criminal sanctions to substance abusers effectively disrupted their, quote, possible treatment and re rehabilitation and therefore should be abolished. So while it is true that this decision made it clear that addiction cannot be a criminal offense, the justices did remark that it is well within the government's right to regulate the possession or trafficking of these substances. And that's what essentially led to these laws coming into place. Um, but to, to back up Ehrlichman's claim, it, it's a really uh, striking claim. Uh, it's really hard to believe that Nixon went out of his way to literally incarcerate hippies and black people, but there's a lot of evidence to back up his claim. Uh, the personal diary of uh, Nixon's White House Chief of Staff, H.R. Haldeman, had one eye-catching entry uh, from April of 69. Uh, Nixon had emphasized that, quote, you have to face the fact that the whole problem is really the blacks. The key is to devise a system that recognized this while not appearing to. Uh, Let's see, over in, uh, in, in December of 1970, uh, Nixon and his uh, friends were talking about a recent episode of All in the Family while in the White House. Uh, the three of them were discussing how Archie Bunker, the aging blue collar family patriarch, had been pitted against his hippie son-in-law who had invited a queer person over to the family home. And uh, Nixon and his friends had agreed that the show's purpose was to quote, upgrade the hippie and to quote, frame the, square hard, uh, frame the square hard hat, end quote, as a villain. Uh, once uh, Archie, the, the father of the family, had realized that one of his longtime beer drinking, football playing, arm wrestling buddies was attracted only to men, Nixon, as he put it, turned the goddamn thing off because you see homosexuality, dope, immorality in general. These are the enemies of strong societies. That's why the communists and the left-wingers are pushing the stuff. They're trying to destroy us. Uh, the anti-war and black power youth of the 1960s displayed a desire to upend establishment politics. And because of this, it became really advantageous for the Nixon administration to, to try and vilify these young adults. Uh, interestingly, the previous uh, administration had tasked the CIA, the CIA with investigating various national protest movements for supposed communist influences. None were ever found. Um, one really controversial provision of the new drug laws was the no-knock rule, which essentially permitted uh, law enforcement agents to ignore the Fourth Amendment and break into people's homes in the search of illegal drugs. In July of 1970, one senator uh, Sam Irvin had argued before Congress that the new uh, no-knock rule had afforded policemen uh, what he called the ability to uh, break into uh, family homes in, quote, the same way that burglars now enter those dwellings, quote, uh, end quote, which was absolutely inconsistent with the Fourth Amendment provisions, which had, quote, prevailed since this nation became a republic. Uh, it, eventually, Congress would repeal the no-knock provision in 1974, and the Supreme Court would reaffirm the necessity of the knock and announce rule in the 90s. Even though that happened, no-knock raids still go on to this very day and have gone on since <laughs> since Harry Anslinger was in office. Um, all you need to uh, the only proof you need is uh, the recent case of uh, the, the unfortunate case of Breonna Taylor. These sort of things still go on. It's all, it's really tragic is what it is. But um, hippies, black activists and political, uh, politically liberal youth were not the first group of people that were painted as violent drug abusers. Such propaganda has for a very long time been used to ostracize various minorities. 
Uh, for over a century, uh, Latinx and black citizens have been stereotyped as violent drug abusers. Uh, America's first drug czar, Harry Anslinger, had infamously incorporated shockingly racist rhetoric into his uh, congressional testimonies and radio spots. Uh, though most of his racist diatribes are unfit to print, uh, it's worthy to note that he felt that, quote, the primary reason to outlaw marijuana is its effect on the degenerate races, end quote. Uh, Ehrlichman's 1981 memoir, Witness to Power, had noted that Nixon wasn't too different from Anslinger. Uh, the president had believed that, quote, blacks were genetically inferior to whites, end quote, and that the drug abuse epidemic was spilling over from the minority communities. Uh, the cannabis prohibition was definitely successful in the president's eyes. Uh, one New York Daily News article from the early 70s noted that nearly 300,000 citizens were arrested under the new cannabis law by 1973, quote, the majority of whom were African American. Uh, coincidentally, uh, Nixon and Anslinger also believed that cannabis induced addiction, social deviance, quote, insanity, criminality, and death, as well as pacifism and communist brainwashing all quotes of Anslinger, but it's clear that Nixon believed the same way. Um, I, I really have to say that Nixon didn't have the best approach to this whole thing. He bumbled along the way. Uh, his approach to tackle public enemy number one wasn't always graceful. There are many, many embarrassing slip ups on the way. Uh, one of the best stories came from uh, when he had a, when he held a bipartisan hearing on uh, on drug abuse. Essentially, he was addressing the subcommittee to investigate juvenile delinquency. And after he had touched on a broad array of methods to combat uh, drug trafficking, uh, he had brought on his friend, Arthur Linkletter, a popular media personality and father of five. Uh, Nixon had invited his, quote, old personal friend uh, because he wanted to allow him to speak with, quote, great knowledge and eloquence uh, on the matter of drug abuse. Uh, for the past two weeks, a link letter had been sharing a story on the radio and television with uh, listeners across America. Uh, essentially, as he put it, quote, my beautiful 20 year old daughter leaped to her death from her apartment while she was in a depressed suicidal frame of mind, end quote, because she had come to believe that, quote, she was losing her mind from reoccurring bad trips from LSD end quote. Uh, while it is true that autopsy results indicated that no recreational substances were in his daughter's uh, system at the time of her death, uh, Linkletter uh, essentially began a lifelong campaign to demonize LSD and laid that foundation within the halls of Congress during this meeting. You know, from Nixon's perspective, Linkletter was a lovable American who could deliver salient emotional appeals to the viewing public. How could it go wrong? Uh, Linkletter first started talking about uh, basic issues surrounding adolescent drug abuse, but his credibility on the topic of drug abuse should have come into question when he started asserting that children across America were, quote, becoming frightened, end quote, of methionine. Methionine? I had to look this up. It's an essential amino acid. That <laughs> bears no inebriating effects. I'm not sure if that was a typo in the in the congressional record or if that was something that he actually said, but you know, I'm actually willing to think that, well, beyond this, he had said that um in certain areas of the country, children were, quote, so crazy and insane as to inject into their bloodstream peanut butter because somebody said that peanut butter gives you a high and they die from that mayonnaise they are inserting into their veins, period. <laughs> My guess was that the foundation for his expertise came from his many decades of researching uh, uh, drug abuse on the popular television segment, Kids Say the Darndest Things, but no, that's just my guess. Um, it's just really ridiculous. Imagine if somebody like Pierce Morgan came on the telly and said that kids were injecting ketchup or mustard to get high. Like, what in the heck? Uh, 
it, with a modern lens, Link Letter sounded like a fool, but people took him seriously at the time. Um, uh, two months after the shootings at Kent State, the Youth International Party had organized their first marijuana smoke in protest in the District of Columbia. And this protest, held on July 4th of 1970, was attended by approximately 25,000 young Americans who had flagrantly disobeyed the uh, cannabis prohibition, which was now in tatters, thanks to Larry. Um, following a contentious discussion about the placement of cannabis within Schedule 1, uh, the majority of our nation's representatives did not feel comfortable enough to place the herb in Schedule 1, as suggested by Nixon and Attorney General John Mitchell. Uh, unfortunately, psilocybin and LSD were not afforded the same grace, although the medical applications for cannabis were largely supported by anecdotal evidence at the time. Clinical studies utilizing psychedelics had clearly shown their promise as, as novel pharmaceutical therapies, but, you know, uh, damn the facts to hell, that was, that was their motto. Uh, in order to come up with an agreement about cannabis, uh, the herb was temporarily placed within Schedule One, pending a congressional review. Uh, Congress established the 73 member National Commission on Marijuana and Drug Abuse, a group known as the Schaefer Commission. Uh, Governor Richard Schaefer of California, handpicked by Nixon, led a group of law and order politicians to exhaustively investigate the history history, health effects, and social impact of cannabis uh, and its use within America. Governor Schaefer would commission over 50 sub-projects and studies while gathering thousands of pages of testimony from various professional experts. Uh, long story short, uh, Governor, Schaefer, uh, Governor Schaefer began his career as a prosecutor who went on to champion a statewide crusade against crime. So Nixon expected that Schaefer was really going to hit this thing hard. Uh, Nixon would tell his chief of staff, Halderman, in May of 1971 that he expected, quote, a goddamn strong statement about marijuana. Can I get that out of this son of a bitching uh, domestic council? Uh, Nixon had clearly requested a report which, quote, tears the ass <laughs> out of those who favored the cannabis uh, over the uh, who had favored the legalization of cannabis. Uh, it was only a week prior that uh, Nixon was complaining to Linkletter in the Oval Office that there were, quote, uh, radical demonstrators in the Capitol and that they were, uh, quote, all on drugs, virtually all. Uh, uh, when uh, Nixon met with Schaefer later in September of that year, uh, the president reiterated his request that the commission's uh, report make it, quote, totally oblivious to the obvious differences between marijuana and other drugs. Uh, Schaefer stood firm and said, uh, no, we're going to release the facts and we're not going to release our statement like a, quote, half-cocked gun. Uh, Nixon would bark back at Schaefer, keep your commission in line. Uh, six months later, uh, Schaefer would come out with a report that pretty much found uh, and confirmed what we now presently know about marijuana that uh, cannabis sp smokers were law-abiding citizens who were not, quote, physically, biochemically, or mentally different, end quote, from non-users, and that the harms of cannabis are insufficient as to justify intrusion by the criminal law into private behavior. Uh, specifically, they made sure to remind the nation that the scientific evidence had shown that the true gateway drugs were, quote, tobacco, followed closely by alcohol. And they also made sure to mention that alcohol abuse was certainly the quote, most destructive drug use pattern, end quote, which America faced. This did not bode well with Nixon and he flat out refused to implement the findings. He had uh, enlisted the help of segregationist Senator uh, James Eastland of Mississippi to pen a scathing rebuke. Uh, his 3,000 page report uh, infamously asserted that if cannabis use were to continue, our nation might wind up, quote, saddled with a large population of semi zombies. Uh, Eastland publicly admitted in December of 1974, years later, that he had, quote, made no apology for injecting his own biases into his one sided congressional hearings. Quote, they were deliberately planned that way. Uh, end result here, uh, Eastland's attempt proved successful. Uh, 
Nixon was happy, cannabis became prohibited. Uh, cannabis users saw a fourfold increase in arrest rates. Moreover, mere possession of substances that were closely associated with the counterculture became federal crimes, which could result in decades of imprisonment and disenfranchisement. Without a word being spoken, the, ru the ruling in Robinson was found to be obsolete in the face of the rising war on drugs. Tens of thousands of Vietnam veterans returned home to uh, uh, face the possibility of incarceration because many had actually become addicts while they were over there. Uh, the, the, the paradigm that was in America was one that did not focus on the rehabilitation in, of drug addicts in any substantive manner. That's not what the new drug laws were about. It was about putting away people in jail and not giving them the help they needed. And uh, just to wrap everything up, there was one really stunning quote that I found in uh, the White House recordings that just really confirmed everything that I thought and knew about Nixon and his beliefs about drug abuse. Um, it was in May, no, March of 1972. He was talking about the new drug laws with uh, Halderman, I think it was. And he was rhetorically asking, you know, who cares about the treating of the addicts, the Yaffe stuff, or I'm sorry, Jaffe stuff. Uh, Dr. Jerome uh, Jaffe had been recently appointed as Nixon's drug czar and was trying to implement a methadone treatment program for heroin addicted Vietnam veterans. Nixon didn't like the idea. He thought that giving uh, drugs to drug addicts was a bad idea. Uh, not too different than the idea of giving LSD to alcoholics, but point being, he didn't like it. And he made the point of saying, you know, who cares about this guy? Who cares about the treating of addicts? Now, Halderman, who was right there next to him, uh, was I, I'm guessing he wasn't aware that this was a rhetorical question. He provided a really shocking, shocking isn't even the right word. It, it's just, it's an appalling answer. He had said that, the mothers don't care because their children aren't addicts. But what you really care about is this son of a bitch is going to come up and try and slip your kid a packet of marijuana. <laughs> Nixon responded, yeah, that's right. I mean, what can you make of that besides just complete denial of the situation? They did not care, it's quite apparent. 